Would you open your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to read verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Moses, as you know, had a veil on his face so that the people couldn't see that the glory of his experience with God was temporary. Mm -hmm. Moses was up on a mountain to see God, and then he had to go down from the mountain. Mm -hmm. And the glory faded. But of course you and I are temples of the Holy Spirit which we have of God. And the glory of the Christian life never fades because God's in us. Amen. He dwells in us. He's our, he's gonna, we're going to be his people. The Hebrews carried a little altar in the midst of the, they had this altar in the, in the midst of the camp. But that was nothing compared to what we experience as God walks and works and dwells in us. So we have an open face. We all with open face beholding as in a glass. Some versions say reflecting like in a mirror. The glory of the Lord are changed, transformed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I am constantly embarrassed by my own ignorance. I've confessed a number of times that for 30 years I sang the battle hymn of the Republic without knowing it was a battle hymn. And it was only in the last few years, Lauren Dickey was still alive, I don't know how long he's been dead, but he was a librarian over at the college, gave me a book by Chaplain McCabe who was a chaplain of the Union Army in the Civil War, told the story of Julia Ward Howe visiting a Union camp of the Union soldiers who were fighting in the Civil War, and they were singing John Brown's Body, which was their battle hymn. John Brown was the abolitionist who was hanged for high treason for his raid at the Federal Arsenal at Harper's Ferry. And... Uh, they would say, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, but his soul goes marching on. And that was her battle hymn. And then they go out and kill Confederate troops. <laughs> there 26,000 Confederate troops died in Yankee prison. It was the most costly war we've ever fought in terms of the loss of American lives. So on that night, uh, Chaplin said to Julia, that's a stirring tune. Why don't you write some good words to it? She said she prayed about it. I awakened way before dawn, found a broken pen, and wrote all of the stanzas of the battle hymn of the Republic without stopping. And the next night, the Union soldiers, as they were getting ready for the battle the next day, cleaning their rifles, polishing their swords, they sang, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out his vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth marching on. Then they went out and killed Confederate too. I, I should have known it was a battle hymn. He's tried it for 30 years. The title of that song was screaming out at me, this is a battle hymn. It's the battle hymn, of the, and I never dawned on me. Well, it was just in the last few months that David Kelly sent me a little thing about the apostles. It was kind of an encouraging thing. I never thought of myself on the same level as the apostles until I read this article. And then it dawned on me that I'm more like the apostles than I thought I was. The apostles, for example, when James and John came to ask positions at the right hand and the left hand of the throne, the ten were filled with indignation. Well, I can do that. <laughs> the uh, apostles, while Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, there was a man with a boy who would fall on the fire and fall in the water, and 
The father brought this boy to the apostles, and they prayed over him, and nothing happened. Well, I could do that. <laughs> they failed. Over and over, I guess a dozen times, the Bible talks about the fear of the apostles. You know, Jesus came to them walking on the water, and they were afraid. After the crucifixion, they locked themselves in there because they were afraid. Well, I can do that. I can be afraid. I've been afraid a bunch of times in my life. Then there was this man who was casting out demons. They had tried to cast out a demon and failed, and when they found a guy casting out a demon, they criticized him. Well, I can do that. There's just a lot of things that the apostles did that I can do. Simon Peter, I think, was kind of a slow learner. The Lord, for example, commissioned him to go into all the world and preach the gospel to the Gentiles. The, the word translated nations is the word for Gentile. Go preach it. He didn't understand that. He, Jesus commanded him, but he didn't understand it. On the day of Pentecost, he inspired him, of course, the, whole, the God spoke through Balaam's ass. I don't know how much the ass comprehended of what he was saying, but he, the dumb ass opened his mouth and spoke the message of God. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, said to these Jews, the promise is to you, it's to your children, it's to all that are for all, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. But he didn't understand it. And then, in the 10th chapter, of the book of Acts, God sent an angel to Cornelius and said, Send to Joppa and fetch one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is speaking to the words whereby thou shalt be saved and your house. While Peter is waiting for dinner, he's on the rooftop and God gives him a vision of all sorts of four-footed beasts and creeping things let down in a great sheet from heaven. And he said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. No, won't do it. Nothing like that. I won't do it. Nothing unclean's ever entered in my mouth. The second time, God sent it down to him. No, nope, not going to. Third time, God sent it down. Then the Spirit told him, well, there's some guys waiting on you. You go with them. So Peter goes down there. And then all of a sudden, something began to dawn on him. And he said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of person. But in every nation, him that feareth God and work of the righteousness is acceptable to him. And then not long after that, he gave to Barnabas and Saul the right hand of fellowship, Paul and Barnabas, and said, you go to the heathen and I'll stick with the circumcision. Peter was a slow learner. Now, we're talking about being transformed into his image. Now, how was Jesus, the master teacher, going to take a guy like Peter? We'll just single him out. Every time the 12 are listed, he's number one. How was Jesus, the master teacher, going to take a guy as dense as Peter and convince him that it was possible for him to become a rock? See, he wasn't. He vacillated. He would say, Lord, if everybody forsakes you, I won't. Jesus said, Peter, the cock won't crow before you deny me three times. And it came to pass that night. What a short memory he must have had. But I got to say also that Peter and Andrew, James and John and the others were selected after a night of prayer. Jesus prayed all night long. Luke chapter 6 states that specifically. He prayed all night long. He called unto him his disciples, and out of those many disciples he chose 12 whom he sent forth as apostles. It wasn't an accident that he chose people like Peter with no credentials. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the base things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Base things and things which are despised hath God chosen. Amen. It wasn't an accident that he chose people just like Peter, just like maybe you, and just like me. Slow learners. People that need an awful lot of help. So, 
They came to Caesarea Philippi, and he said, Who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets. Well, who do you say? Peter said, Well, you're the Christ. Jesus congratulated him and said, On this rock I'm going to build my church, and the gates of the unseen world, the gates of Hades, not going to prevail against it. And from that time, Jesus, in the plainest language, began to tell them, it is necessary for the Son of Man to go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things at the hands of the chief priests, scribes, and elders, and be crucified. But I'm going to be raised again the third day. Don't worry. The gates of hell, the gates of Hades are not going to prevail. And they didn't understand it. So he said, well, i got to give them another lesson. So he took them to a very high mountain six days later. And especially just took three, Peter, James, and John. And something happened up there that directly relates to our subject tonight. We're talking about being changed into His image. Amen. The word in 2 Corinthians 3.18, changed is the word for metamorphosis. It's the thing that happens to a caterpillar. A caterpillar is a very carnal thing. All they do is eat, and they destroy everything around them. I mean, they have a voracious appetite. And they never travel very far, never do anything worthwhile. They're just a caterpillar. But that caterpillar goes through a metamorphosis. And is it the same or not? I mean, when the monarch butterfly comes out of the cocoon, it doesn't look like a caterpillar, doesn't act like a caterpillar, doesn't think like a caterpillar. It's got a new mind. Caterpillar, can you imagine how much trouble you would have? You know, the monarch butterfly begins its life cycle down way south in Southern California or Mexico on a milkweed plant, just a little seed. Then after about three generations, it winds up in Canada. And then as the fall of the year comes around, somehow God puts into the mind of the butterfly the ability to fly all the way to Mexico. He's never been to Mexico before, doesn't have any map, doesn't have any direction, never been to flying school, never been to that navigation school, and yet somehow millions and millions. Now can you imagine what it would be like to get a bunch of college students and round up these caterpillars and say, now it's almost winter. In a couple of weeks it's going 20 degrees below zero here. You're going to have to march to Mexico. Line up and get going. It's to the south. So then it would not work. But the power of God operating in that caterpillar, that caterpillar transforms it. The word metamorphosis is only found four times in the Bible. Two times it refers to Jesus on the Mount of Metamorphosis, on the Mount of Transfiguration. So he takes Peter and James and John up on a mountain. Moses got the law on a mountain. Now Jesus is going to start teaching them about the new covenant. And he, he takes them up on a mountain. All of a sudden, the face of Jesus began to shine. Just like, well, I don't know, just like. Remember, Moses' face was shining, but it was a temporary thing with Moses. Was it the same Jesus or not? The Bible says, while they watched him, he was transfigured. And his countenance was white and glistening. And he spoke with Moses and Elijah about his decease, which he should accomplish in Jerusalem. And he, he appeared to them in glory. Amen. <laughs> I appreciated Brother Strauss making reference to that word. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I'm not a scholar of anything, but I only know a few Hebrew words, but that's one of the words I know is the word kabod which is literally translated as heavy a number of times in Scripture. Absalom pulled his head, cut his hair every year, and it was heavy. That's the word for glory. Eli, 98 years old, sitting on a rock. The ark of God had been taken into battle. And word came that it had been captured by the Philistines and his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were dead and he fell over backwards and broke his neck and died 
because he was kabod, heavy. So when the glory of God came down on the tabernacle, the Hebrews said, hey man, that's heavy. Ain't never seen nothing like that before. You, you say, well, what was it like? Say, well, you had to be there. I can't tell you what it was like to see the presence of God descend out of heaven. You had to be. It was glory. It was heavy. It was profound. It was weighty. And there is this aspect of the new covenant that can only be experienced. I can't tell you what it's like to be transformed into his image. You've got to experience it yourself. Amen. So Peter was on the mountain. Now it was probably 30 years later. It may have dawned on him before then, but when he wrote to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, he said, you know, we haven't followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were with him at the holy mount. We heard the voice come from heaven which said, this is my beloved son. Now, you would do well to take heed unto the prophetic word. Amen. Like a light shining in a dark place until the day dawn. And the day star arises in your heart. You see, the transformation that you experience from the works of the flesh to the fruit of the spirit comes from within. The only other, you see, two times the word metamorphosis refers to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Two times it refers to you and me. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we read a moment ago. Romans 12.2 is the other passage. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The transformation, the metamorphosis comes from within. God said, I'm going to take away your heart of stone. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit within you. I am going to cause you to walk in my ways. Now, when they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus said, don't even try to tell anybody about this. You can't do it. Don't, after I'm resurrected, then try it. But now don't, don't even talk about it. Just think. Just, well, 77 times in the Gospels, we have the Greek verb akalotheo, which means to follow. And every time it refers to Jesus but one. And that's Mark chapter 14. Jesus sent two of his disciples into Jerusalem to prepare the Passover, and he said, you'll see a man carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Now, it's a very easy thing, in a sense, to follow somebody. If uh, we live out in the country, over not far from Joplin, and about every time somebody comes to our house for the first time, I meet them some, at some prominent landmark and let them follow me. Because it's easier than drawing them a map. So Jesus didn't say, I'm going to give you guys a special Bible or a special map. He just said, follow me. Now that was easy, but it was hard from the standpoint that in order to do that, they had to deny themselves what they wanted to do otherwise. They may have wanted to rest. And Jesus said, follow me. I'm on my way to Capernaum. I'm on my way to Jerusalem. Just follow me. Well, Lord, we're going to go fishing. No, he said, follow me. They dropped their fishing nets and they followed him. So following Jesus is simple but it requires self-denial. Then Jesus in the upper room said, I'm going to go where you can't follow, but don't worry, I'm not leaving you orphans. I'm going to come back and I'm going to continue to lead you. I'm going to continue to give you guidance and strength and help, and you are then going to be empowered to follow me. Now, when we're thinking about you, and some of you, I guess, are just like me, you're not real... You're not straight-A students. You make a lot of mistakes and so forth. And the secret to you being transformed into his image involves power. Let me tell you a couple of stories. Do you know the story of Dwayne Miller? 
I love this story. And I did an interview with Dwayne Miller at Good News Productions International, and you can rent the video, about a 40-minute testimony. Dwayne Miller, Baptist preacher, was on staff at the Big Baptist Church in Houston, 24,000 members. He got his own church in Brenham, Texas, where Sam Houston was baptized and where the Baylor family had attended. He was preaching there for several years when January 1990, he lost his voice. He had been a singer, preacher, that was his life. And he kept going to one doctor after another. He was under the care of 17 specialists. He says there's the doctors that Pavarotti and Frank Sinatra go to because through the Baylor University Medical School, they had access to, to uh, medical uh, experts from all over the world. After a year of being on salary by the church, the Brenham Church continued paying for a year. Um, he just said, I'm resigning. And when he spoke, he would speak with it, with it, just barely, you could just barely understand him. He went to Houston, got a job in a courthouse doing legal work, but he couldn't get clients because they were, his work was involving a lot of court cases and so forth, and nobody wanted him as an expert witness because he lacked the credibility in court as a witness because he couldn't talk. Tried to write a book. Publicist says, Dwayne, you have no name recognition, and you couldn't have a book tour, you couldn't lecture. He had health insurance, but everything they were doing for him was experimental, so the health insurance quit paying, and I think he had a $22,000 hospital bill sitting on the desk. He had disability income, that ran out. Three years to the Sunday from the time his voice left him, it was January the 17th, 1993, huge church, had one Sunday school class with about 200 members, and they fixed up a headset with a microphone at his lips so that he could be heard. And he is teaching the 103rd Psalm, a psalm which had been selected by the Southern Baptist Convention six years before. It was a part of their regular Sunday school rotation. That's the psalm that says... He forgives our sins, he heals our diseases, and he lifts us up out of the pit. And when Dwayne A. Miller spoke those words, he lifts us up out of the pit, his voice was immediately and instantaneously healed. In 10 minutes, he was the most famous man in a church of 24,000 members. And they had him up in the pulpit before the whole congregation saying, tell us what happened to you. He says, I don't know what happened to me. The promise keepers wanted him to speak. Publicists wanted to print what he said. He, when he was in Joplin last year, November or December of last year, he said he'd had 10,000 people respond to the gospel already. Now I want you to remember what Paul was writing about to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians, he said, I didn't rely on the excellency of speech or wisdom because I didn't want your faith to stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Amen. The power to transform a life has been experienced by Dwayne Miller and I give out his 800 number all the time, 800-993-TAPE. You call that and that he's given out over 50,000 copies free of charge. No charge. You just call and say, I want a complimentary copy of the tape. And it's his Sunday school lesson where he says, in his Sunday school lesson, the Schofield Reference Bible and other scholars are trying to put God in a box and say, well, he did this and that dispensation, but he won't do this now. And Dwayne said, every time we try to put God in a box, he kicks the walls out. We're talking about you and me being transformed into his image, and I'm suggesting that one of the ways this happens is in the power of God. Jesus told Peter, James, and John, don't tell anybody about this till after the resurrection. That's when you get the power. Tarry in Jerusalem until you get power from on high. Amen. About two months ago, six weeks ago, I don't know, Brother Seth, you remember when the Pioneer Bible Translators had their, what, six weeks ago, something like that? on campus at the Ozark Christian College. One day I just said, well, I was busy, but I, I want to go down and at least have some fellowship. So at noon I went down there to eat with the people who had come from the Pioneer Bible Translator. 
And I'm sitting there, and I didn't recognize anybody at the table where I was. Lady came, sat down right across from me. Her name was Martha. Her name is Martha Huddleston. And we were small talking and visiting and everything. And in the course of the conversation, she said, well, I used to have multiple sclerosis. I said, you did? What happened? She said, God healed me. I said, tell me that story. Well, I got so fascinated by the story that we went over on that Friday to Good News Productions International and I sat down before a video camera and did a 40 minute interview with Martha Huddleston and I'm going to just briefly tell you the story. I don't think the film has been edited yet because as soon as I, it is, I want to show it in our church. It's a remarkable story. These people were in Zaire, which is the old Belgian Congo. And they were pioneer Bible translators. They were there for eight years. And they were the traditional missionaries from the standpoint that they were out in the jungle, no electricity, no running water, just very primitive conditions. And they were with the people who didn't even have a written language. And they were reducing their language to writing. They were translating the word of God into, into their language. And she had been a victim of multiple sclerosis since she was a teenager. Didn't know what it was originally. She said, I'd be walking all of a sudden I'd fall down. I'd try to put something in the oven and I would drop it. And she went to one doctor after another and finally was diagnosed with MS and then gradually grew weaker and weaker and weaker until she had to use a wheelchair and one of these motorized uh, scooters and uh, so forth. And this is ironic. And when I told her the story of Dwayne Miller, she said goosebumps went up and down her spine because she was healed on January the 17th, same day that Dwayne Miller was healed, only two years later. And she said, I had come to the end of my rope, emotionally, physically, spiritually, in every other way. I had tried to commit suicide. And I just said to God, I cannot go on. I'm ready to die or whatever, but I cannot go on anymore. And she fell down before God in prayer like Jacob did at Peniel. After several hours of agony before God, she said, a peace came over me. And I got the best sleep I had had in 10 years. The next day, when I awakened, I said to Mark, Mark teaches at the Summer Institute of Linguistics in Dallas. She said, Mark, I want to go to work with you today if it's all right. He said, well, I'll get your wheelchair. She said, no. Well, he said, I'll get your scooter. She said, no. Well, I'll get your canes. She said, no, I'll walk. And she did. Now she said, I was weak then. But she says, today I walk two miles every other day and I swim in between, and I am symptom-free from multiple sclerosis. I said, praise the Lord. She says, that's the small miracle. I said, what's the big one? She said, boys, it's embarrassing to talk about, but I did not love my husband. They had been married 24 years. And she said, I would pray to God that he would die or commit adultery so that I could be released from my marriage vows. And now, they've had a honeymoon since January of 1995. She is radiant with happiness. Now what happened to her? Is it remotely possible that this woman is experiencing the power of the gospel. You cannot make a fruit, period. You can't do it. If you had billions of dollars and the help of the most sophisticated laboratories on earth, you couldn't make an apple, you couldn't make an orange, you couldn't make a pear, you couldn't make a peach. You cannot make fruit. So the works of the flesh are manifest. And they include such terrible things as adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, hatred, enmity, variance, wrath, strife, seditions, heresy, drunkenness, revelings, things like that. But when the Holy Spirit, when you come before God, now don't 
trifle with God. Jeremiah said, you will search for me and you will find me when you search for me with your whole heart. And then, of course, the most famous commandment in the Bible, the most foundational, fundamental thing in the Bible is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Not just some peripheral thing in your life, but you come to God lock, stock, and barrel. It's like taking up a cross. It's like laying down your life and everything. And then, out of the morass of the death to self comes a seed of new life. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abides alone. Amen. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And I'm telling you that when you come to the place where you love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, when you commit yourself unto him, something marvelous and miraculous happens to you. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're no longer the same. You're not just a reorganization of ideas. Everything is new about you. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and all things become new. Now I call to your attention how many times the word glory occurs in the text of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The word glory, as I mentioned, is the word kabod, which means heavy, profound, weighty. Brother Strauss mentioned the word doxa, which means glory in the Greek language. It comes from the word dokeo, which means to seem, a rather inspecific word, because it deals with your own personal experience. The Old Covenant is called the ministration of death. Paul said in verse 5, not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiencies of God who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. This letter kills, the Spirit gives life. You remember, Paul did have some degrees. He was the only apostle who had anything to brag about. Only apostle who was educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Only apostle who had all these credentials. And he said, I threw them on the garbage heap that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of God by faith. But in the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious hath no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Not like Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil's upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord and are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I think at another renewal I may have told you this story but I want to repeat it. It's the story of the great stone face by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Some of you read it in school. It's a secular story but it seems to me to be a commentary on this very verse which we have selected as a text for the evening message. According to the legend, the story, the parable of the great stone face, high up in the white hills of New Hampshire, God had carved out on the perpendicular side of a mountain the likeness of a human face. Now you couldn't see it if you stood close. All you would see, ponderous and gigantic stones, heaped in chaotic ruin one upon another. But if you retrace your steps, if you stand back far enough, the great stone face came alive. And if there was a cloud around the top of the mountain, it seemed as if the great stone face had white hair. And if the thunder reverberated, it seemed as he was trying to speak. In the shadow of the mountain, a little boy was born. His name was Ernest. 
And as a toddling child, he would hold his mother's hand and she would tell him the legends of the great stone face. It seems that the Indians said that there would someday come to their valley a man who looked just like that. He would be the personification of every good virtue and trait imaginable. And Ernest would clap his hands in childish delight and pray for the day. And I want to see that man. And this became the all-consuming passion of his life as a teenager. Word was out that the man was on his way. He had been born there. He had gone to far countries and become, become the wealthiest man in the world. Now he was returning to the place of his birth for his retirement years. And Ernest was in the crowd as people were throwing hats in the air and applauding. And the man's carriage came right down the road, right by Ernest. And he went away with a sad countenance. Someone said, what's wrong, Ernest? He said, that isn't him. There's a shallow and superficial resemblance to the face on the mountain, but it's not him. And after a period of time, the people agreed with Ernest. The guy was far too selfish, far too egotistical to be the personification of their hopes and dreams. And this then sets the stage for one failure after another. The next time it was the decorated and battle-scarred veteran of many foreign wars, a very famous general, that everybody thought looked like the face on the mountain, but he, was, he wasn't. And then it was a poet, and then it was a politician, and over and over their hopes would rise only to be dashed by the reality that these were carnal, worldly, greedy, un-Christ-like individuals. Now Ernest was an old man, his back was bent, his hair was gray. But as his mother had taught him to do each evening, he would stand and look at the face and meditate. And as the years went on, people who had problems came to Ernest because he seemed to be wiser than anybody else in their village. And they would travel from great distances. And they'd come, and soon it was so crowded that he would have to stand up on the side of the hill there at the base of the mountain. There was a beautiful tapestry of green foliage before him. And there was a place like a pulpit, just large enough for a man to stand and make whatever gestures would normally accompany genuine thought and earnest emotion. Well, on a particular night, as Ernest was speaking to the people, the people were down there before him, and Ernest was there speaking, and his gray hair was diffused about his face. In the mountain, the, in the background was the face on the mountainside with white clouds swirling about the top of the mountain. And the people watching and listening to Ernest threw up their hands by an irresistible impulse and said, Ernest is himself the image of the great stone face. Now conversion is instantaneous, but transformation is not. Transformation takes a lifetime. Now listen again to the words of scripture. We all with open face. We don't have a veil on like most. We have an open face. We enter in boldly into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. They wouldn't even pronounce the name of God. We call him Abba, Father, because the Holy Spirit empowers us to do that. Amen. We all with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And while we focus on Jesus, study about Jesus, pray to Jesus, follow Jesus, we're going through a metamorphosis from one degree of glory to another. And all of this happens by the power of his blessed Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Amen. Oh, Father, thank you for those who've come. Thank you for the study they have invested in your word. Thank you for the genuine thought and earnest emotion they have given to the new covenant and the glories associated with it. And now, Father, we come down to this final message about being transformed into his image. Oh, Father, I know you're not done with us yet. Reassure us that you will never tempt us beyond what we're able to bear. Help us to remember and never doubt that you will never leave us or forsake us. And when our life is over, may we have attained by the power of your Spirit to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. For we ask this prayer in his name. Amen.